So I'm here at the One Rental at a Time event in Las Vegas, celebrating Michael Zuber's 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. And I have with me one of the best to do long distance real estate investing in the country. And you know he's the best because he managed to get on Michael Zuber's podcast as a reoccurring guest and be featured as a speaker here today. Brian Adamson, how you doing? I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me, man. Dude, I am so excited to talk to you because I feel abused all the time online. As somebody who invests in Gary, Indiana, everybody always goes, there's just no way. You can't be making cash flow. There must be so many problems. Who in the world would invest there? And at least I always get to tell them, well, it's not Detroit. <laughs> and I got with me a guy who is the king of investing at a distance yeah. in Detroit. My fellow struggler when it comes to this long distance game in tough cities. But what we want to talk with you about today is how'd you get started investing there and, and how do you do it at a distance? Yeah. So the, the short of my long story is I started investing because I'm a native to Detroit. I live in Orlando, but I'm from Detroit. I started investing there in 2006, my junior year in college. But it's so interesting. I was just telling the story to someone yesterday that it wasn't until after eight years of investing in Detroit, it was a unique time when I started investing, right? So I started investing when the market was at its height, 2006. And then I you know, used stated income loans and all these bad vehicles. Right. Then 2008 happened, right? And so for me, I was naive in the sense that I didn't know what was going on other than the fact that these properties that were 150,000 are now 7,500 bucks. Right. So I'm like, I'm gonna buy more of those. <laughs> well, I couldn't understand why people were pulling out of the market. It made no sense to me. But, but I learned in a broken market, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when the market started to change, I didn't have a skill set for the new market. Mm -hmm. So what I used to do didn't work anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, finally, when I got some education, got mentorship after being seven, eight years on my own and making a tremendous amount of mistakes. When I got mentorship, though, this was what was so interesting to me, a place that I had grown up all my life. At this time, I'm in my late 20s. And for the first time in my life, I learned the market. And it was much different than anything that I ever known, right? And so I always encourage people, regardless if you're a native to somewhere, you think by default that you understand that market, but it's more subjective than it is objective. You don't know how to really look at the data and analyze each micro market within that market the way in which we should as you know competent and prudent investors. And so um, after learning the market, right, it just so happened that I also moved to Florida in December of 2010. And when I got down to Florida, I started doing some deals, but I realized that the margins weren't as good as the ones that I were doing in Detroit. Right. And so with this newfound information, I realized Detroit was an amazing market to continue to buy in. And so I had to learn how to not only restructure my business because the previous model didn't work anymore, mm -hmm. but then I also had to figure out how to make it work for me 800 miles away. And as I started to develop the framework for that and as made a ton of mistakes and figuring that out as well, for the last six years, I've been able to help people all over the world invest remotely themselves from as far as Denmark, Japan, Afghanistan, all throughout the States. Right, right. Um, because it, as you know, Mike, it, it really is developing a system and a framework. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, whether you're doing it in your backyard, eight, eight blocks away or 800 miles away, mm -hmm. it's really all the same if you have that foundation set. Especially with modern technology, things like Zoom, video, phone calls, everything you can do now. People, I think, have a mental block when it comes to long distance investing that it's not that hard to overcome. Mm -hmm. But you brought up so many different topics we got to hit on. Micro markets within a market, the importance of getting skills, the importance of having a mentor. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and start with skills because mm -hmm. I think that's where we need to start. So <clears throat> when you first started out, like everybody, you're green. But over time, you started to develop the skills that made it possible for you to become the investor that you are today. Mm -hmm. So what were some of those mile posts that you passed in terms of your skill and development that brought you to where you are now? That's a great question. I would say initially, it was being an enigma of my friend group to be and the first in my family to go out and invest in real estate. So that in and of itself was monumental, right? That I was somebody from the environment that I was in Detroit to go out and start investing in real estate. And albeit to go out and buy 20 doors in my mid twenties, which was even crazier, right? But again, based on where the market was at that time, you could buy these things for so cheap. I just took wild advantage of it. In doing so, I defaulted into being a, a self-manager. Why? Because I didn't even know property management existed. So you know, here I am. <laughs> what, right? what other option? <laughs> what other option is it, right? Like I've seen Jack Trevitt and Mr. Furley. This thing kind of, I guess this is how I go for everybody, right? So I'm dating myself now for those that got that reference. But um, 
Yeah, so I self-managed, but that taught me a lot. I got a lot of education on people and how people operate and how people don't keep their word and the result of them not doing so and the things that happen within the house and maintaining one. And uh, it's interesting because now that I think about it, I bought investment properties before I ever had a primary residence. <laughs> right? <laughs> you were that dedicated. I don't need to live someplace. I need money. Because I started in college. Right. 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 So I didn't need a primary yep. residence yet. Yep. So, so inadvertently, I, I was maintaining properties that I never lived in. So when I got my primary residence, I had to then figure out how to maintain a house for myself. Right. I digress. But that's just crazy. I thought about that. But but that was another milestone or or, or mar mile marker, as you would indicate. Because, is that me? I heard something. You didn't hear that? No. Huh. Maybe. Yes. OK. Oh, no, it was Siri. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me cut this up. OK. Sorry about that. guy. And so another one of those milestones was self-managing because I didn't understand how like the skill that I was developing in mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, and also in developing that skill, I understood how to better hold a property management company accountable when I eventually got a property management right. company, right. because a lot of the time we want to delegate responsibilities so early in the process. But if you delegate and don't know how to manage other people, then how do you hold them accountable? Mm -hmm. Right. It's the quickest way to lose money in this business. So I'm grateful for that. And then the next big milestone was when I went and got mentorship. Mm -hmm. One, because I was ignorant to the fact that it existed. Where I come from, everything seminar related was like Primerica, Ponzi scheme, pyramid, right? right? So you stayed away from it. Mm -hmm. um, but ignorance is expensive. And I figured that out because it cost me a lot to not be in the room with the people that had the knowledge and the infrastructure that I needed to really grow and scale my business. Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to continue on with mentorship because we talked about the skill building process, mentorship, micro markets within a market, but mentorship number two, who did you find and what did they teach you or what did you learn from them that took you to the next level? So the, the thing that I believe moved the needle most. So Armando Montalago was my first mentor. And uh, this was back in like that Than Merrill, uh, those guys yeah. when they were at the yep. forefront. Everything was $40,000 to get help back then, right? Leverage all your credit cards, sell your <laughs> child, whatever you had to do. But did, you got to get in the yeah. room, right? And uh, one of the biggest things was one, understanding that before I was a landlord, not a business owner. So learning about asset protection and how to properly structure my business to keep me from being personally liable in the way in which I was doing things. Secondly, was the fact that you could raise capital from people. I had no idea, right? I asked somebody for a thousand bucks, much less a hundred thousand where right. I come from. Like you're out your mind, mm -hmm. right? So, so lear learning that there were people out there that not only would give you money, but were excited about it, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. was the whole it's game an opportunity changer for me. For it's an opportunity yeah. for them. So learning that and then learning like all of the frameworks for holding people accountable, right? Everybody from realtors to contractors, every tentacle of your business, because you need to understand what they're supposed to do back to accountability, which was my whole talk yesterday, right? So th those were three key pieces that, and then obviously the skill of uh, fix and flip and wholesale. Because prior to that, I just defaulted into buying rental properties because I didn't know how to do anything else. Mm -hmm. So here I go, right? And just to, on the, the raising capital piece, why that was so critical, because again, as I was defaulting into buying these properties during the market contraction, essentially, and this wasn't by, this wasn't intentional, but we were putting lipstick on a pig, <laughs> as I later figured out, right? right? Like, like you know, clean toilets, like we, we put paint, all of that, but didn't understand mechanical systems, didn't understand mm -hmm. roofing systems, didn't understand electrical systems. Um, just didn't understand like all of the major arteries inside the property mm. and just so happened when you scale out and buy that many of them so quickly the problems tend to scale with them right. and so as these things came up well I also didn't know about capex and reserves right mm -hmm. the rent came in that money was getting spent you know what <laughs> what I mean? so um, found myself in a unique position where I'm like well I knew I couldn't be a slumlord mm -hmm. so I ended up selling off 90% of that portfolio on the down market which was like 2013 14 15 market hadn't fully recovered yet, mm -hmm. right? And had I been able to, you know, just go out and raise 150 grand back then, I could have kept the portfolio. And when COVID happened and all the big boys started to exit, you know, I left two and a half million bucks on the table. A mistake that I'm sure you regret. Yeah. How have you changed to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again? You talked about raising private money. What do you, and a lot of people have that question. They really want to learn how to raise private money. 
what advice you have for him? Don't gamble with other people's money. Absolutely. You know, I think it's it's a lot easier to get somebody to give you some money than you really think mm -hmm. when you start having the right conversation. But it's your job to be the best steward over that money. And not to say that everything goes perfect in business, but you can't go out there negligible either, right? right. And so it's, it's your responsibility to go become the expert to, to whatever level that you possibly can mm -hmm. so that you know that when they give you your money, you're putting them in the best possible position ever. Right. I couldn't agree more. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm afraid of losing my own money. I don't want to. I hate the idea of it, but I am petrified of losing someone else's money because with it goes my reputation that I've worked so hard for years to build. I won't lose other people's money when I partner with them. I'd rather pay out of my own pocket first. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that, that uh, mindset you have there. All right, we've talked about a bunch of different topics. But I think most people are still really wondering, how do we do this at a distance? You talked about systems and frameworks and processes. What are those systems, frameworks, and processes? Mm -hmm. And how do you manage them from Florida? Mm -hmm. The most critical component to out-of-state investing, and I'd love to get your opinion on this as well, but the, to me, the most critical component is the project manager, mm -hmm. whoever is your boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because that person, those people, are essentially replicating you in that marketplace physically, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and then the next most important after that, in my opinion, is then the contractor. Like, so what does that what does that fulfillment team look like? Mm -hmm. Because as you know, and I know new investors, if you listen to this, you're gonna be like, no, it's not. But but here's <laughs> the thing: raising capital and finding deals is the easiest part. Like acquisition yes. is the yep. easiest part of our yep. business. And if you don't have a deal and you've been looking for twelve months, you're like, no, there's no way. Mm -hmm. I promise you. The hardest thing to do in our business is execute. Right. And so it's imperative that we have a great project manager that we can trust, right? That they're actually going to go there, be as intentional as mm -hmm. we will be in our absence, and that there is no collusion between them and the contractor as yep. well so that they can effectively and truly hold them accountable. Right. Right. No, I, I, I think it's an amazing point that you make right there. And so my only difference, when I tell people how to get started investing at a distance, mm -hmm. The most important person that I tell them is the other investors that are successful. I point them to the mentor first mm -hmm. because who's going to recommend that property manager? Who's going to recommend those contractors? I don't want to go on Google and look it up. I want to find Brian Adamson when mm -hmm. I want to invest in Detroit. I want to find you and then I want to learn from you. And then I want to copy, paste and steal your ideas and success so that I can do half as good a job. Mm -hmm. But you hit a point, terminal velocity, where you've been doing it enough on your own that even though you still need mentors to help you out, you're kind of self-sustaining at that point. Mm -hmm. And at that point, as you said, property manager, project manager, contractors, absolutely. I need people who are going to get good tenants. I need people who are going to maintain my properties and be checking on them. And I need to know when I send contractors out there, they're going to do good work right the first time. So I don't got to keep paying and keep paying and bleed myself on CapEx and vacancies and maintenance. So mm -hmm. I think you make a very good point there. Yeah. And, and I do agree with your approach in terms of aligning yourself with people that have been successful in that market. Mm -hmm. I just don't teach my students to do it that way only because I don't want them looking for a crutch. Right. Right. And sometimes, and I've seen this with my own situation where I've given someone a referral mm -hmm. that has worked out phenomenal for me. Right. But because that person fails to manage that individual mm -hmm. the same way in which I do, they don't get the same result. Right. So it's referrals are great. And I, the reason why I say project manager is because that person has a vested interest because I'm paying them. Mm -hmm. That's the currency that keep everything flowing. Somebody else, they're doing it out of goodwill but only not to the detriment of slowing down their business as well. Mm -hmm. Because if they're Cadillac and they got great resources, if whatever you're doing is infringing on whatever they're doing, then there's also a conflict because they could give you their B players instead of their A ones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's always nuanced to that. I just always like the grassroots approach because as you build the team out on your own and you go through your own vetting process and you're paying those people, you can now hold them better accountable in my experience. I, I agree with you 100%. And when you're holding them accountable, when you're checking in with your team, what does that look like? Is it phone calls? Is it Zoom? Do you fly out to Detroit on a regular basis? How are you doing this at a distance? All of it. Okay. Right. So I uh, I got a regular cadence with my project manager and property manager. Okay. And I'm going to give my cadence, but you don't have to necessarily keep this cadence because it may not be the best cadence for you. So for me, we meet my project manager and I every Monday evening for 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. 
then we meet again on Thursday to kind of talk about the progress of the week and then get out ahead of pre-planning for the upcoming week, right? I also talk to my property manager on Thursday that morning so that there's if there's any other issues that may need to be pushed up to the project manager, depending on what type of project we're working on, then I'm already ahead of that so that we got everybody on the same sheet of music. Intermittently, I may talk to a contractor here and there if I have to, if for whatever reason, them and the project manager hit an impasse and can't get beyond whatever it is. But for the most part, I don't really direct, deal directly with the con contractors anymore mm -hmm. outside of the initial process of vetting them. So my project manager, any new resources, and it's a she, right? And I actually like a woman in this position for a myriad of reasons. One, they're typically not jealous of you and want to be you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they're extremely thorough in everything that they do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and they just, the one I work with, she don't take no mess, period, mm -hmm. from guys or whomever. And so I just, that alliance works really well for me. And so I typically she pre-screens everybody. And then once we're going to make a decision, then I, I'll talk to that individual as well, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm the one stroking the check. I still want to know who we're working with and make sure that there wasn't any blind spots or anything that she may have missed mm -hmm. in that process. But that's essentially it. I got a rhythm in my business with over 100 units. You know, I'm spending six to eight hours a month on my business. Now, did it start there? Absolutely not. I mean, while I haven't been in Detroit since October of even that time, no, I did see my projects because we had an event where I was taking people around in my projects. But yeah, this is the longest I've been in three years not going up there. It's been almost six months. Okay. And unfortunately, it's still cold and I got to go back in about three weeks <laughs> I when I get back from Paris. <laughs> oh, my God. But but the visibility is there, right? The the cloud that we use, the the video enhancements that you talked about with technology, there's, a, there's just a tremendous amount of visibility and transparency to where I, I haven't had to go, mm -hmm. you know? And quite honestly, even when I went before and it was more frequent, it was less to go see the projects it was more to shoot content at the projects right. to teach people mm -hmm. and then also to to just do the the peripheral stuff like take my team out to dinner to lunches and just galvanize them and be present so that they can still feel me close to them mm -hmm. so to speak mm -hmm. yeah it's funny i get asked all the time well, how often do you go out to indiana to look at your properties and i'm like you know what I, I make it there about once every six months but it's funny i don't really go to see my properties i go to see people i go to to massage the relationships to check in to make sure i'm doing some of the networking that it takes to run a successful business it's not always i need to go make sure the flooring was installed right i got people right. that do that stuff for right. me and too many exactly. projects for me to maintain all of that so yeah. and it's also funny you managed or mentioned your project manager is a female because my property manager who manages a lot of projects is also and she gets more with honey than with vinegar that's right she asks nicely she's polite she gets underestimated she sweet talks everybody into doing what we need so yeah. i love her in that role all right one final topic you talked about micro markets within a market mm -hmm. and i think this is very important because people when they're looking to get started investing in a distance and they look at the city of if gary indiana or detroit it's hard for them to break down and understand what a micro market within a market is. Can you expound on that just a little? Yeah, and I'm sure <laughs> you got a deep affinity and some deep wounds behind what I'm about to say, <laughs> right? Uh, when you look at a market, most people look at it from a city perspective. Mm -hmm. Then you have the next level of investor that look at it from a zip code perspective. Right. And then you have guys like us that invest in very unique markets yeah. to where if you look at it from a zip code, you can have five different ARVs within mm -hmm. a quarter mile radius, oh, yeah. right? You can literally cross one mile road mm -hmm. in Detroit and drop $100,000 in value. It's yep. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm talking about micro markets, I'm talking about legitimately looking at it from a subdivision perspective, even in some mm -hmm. cases, um, or you know, within a very tight frame. So these, these micro markets have names based on how they're platted on the map and all the rest of it and you know we could we could have five micro markets in one zip code mm -hmm. which is unbelievable right right and uh for, for investors especially those who are looking out of state and this is very important for them because many of them are going to be looking at a zip code perspective mm -hmm. and so they're going to think man i could pick this thing up for 100 grand it's worth 350. Yeah, hey, it's like listen, you wish <laughs> if it was if it was 100 grand worth 350 it wouldn't be available. It'd be gone. Already. Let's just use some yeah. deductive reasoning yeah. here for a yeah. second. 200 days on market. You really think that's <laughs> yeah. how it is? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. But it happens every day. All the time. And people are so excited because they're like, my God, I'm spending 400 grand out here in Vegas. I mm -hmm. could pick this thing up for 40. And it's like, but cheap properties are expensive. Right. right. 
Right. You right? go broke buying cheap. 100%. Because you never know what's on the other side of that. And if you think you just got that great of a deal, ask yourself, why does it exist? 100%. Yeah. So, so do you see the same in, in Indiana? It, I tell people because they call me up and they say, hey, what zip codes should I look at? That, bro, it's block by block. Yeah. Gary, Indiana has 13,000 abandoned buildings in it. You got to look block by block. Does this block have 10 nice houses and two abandoned and you're buying one of those to do the burst strategy and now you can do an ARV based off the surrounding mm -hmm. houses? Awesome. Are you buying one abandoned house surrounded by ab abandoned houses? Probably not a good idea. Well, the Google Maps picture showed, I don't care what they showed. It was from 2013. It right. doesn't look like that anymore. You need to tell your agent to get their phone out, drive down the street recording one way, turn around, drive back up the street recording the other way, and then watch the video and make sure that you don't see cars up on cinder blocks and all the other stuff that's going to say the ARV ain't going to be where you want it to be. That's how you properly research it. So I, I, I love hearing somebody make that point. For sure. Brian, yeah, micro markets within a market, uh, skilling up, building a network, getting mentorship, doing it all at a distance. Uh, phenomenal takes, phenomenal points. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, sir. Last, last question. What's the one piece of advice you have for somebody who wants to get started investing at a distance right now in 2024? Shout out to Zuber. Do the work. Accountability from what you said yesterday. Yes, sir. Appreciate you being here. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mike.